But where will you land when the wind ceases? Where will you end up? How will you go through? All of that is part of your making and your calling. What's your attitude? Isaiah chapter 6. All right. Now, before I get into this, some of y'all going to have to get on the good foot. And some of y'all going to have to get off the pot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, get on the good foot or get off the pot. I'm saying it real cute, ain't I? You know what I'm saying. So, what I want to say to you is... God has got his hand on every single one of us. We have, each one of us has been called for a purpose or many purposes. The bottom line is, are you about your father's business? Are you getting ready to be about your father's business? Because knowing that these are the last days, God's going to teach you a whole lot of gardening skills and he's going to teach you a whole lot of fishing skills. So, first one he deals with is self. Before he sends you out there, he deals with self. So let's go with Isaiah chapter 6, and we'll read a few verses, and then we'll go on to the next one, which is Isaiah 44. Remember, we're in the last days, and God is calling all hands on deck. Starting at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. And with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Hmm. I'm going to stop there. Because what God was doing at that point, was he was calling Isaiah. He was calling him into the ministry. He was calling him to be his prophet. My question to you, what is God calling you to do? Hmm? What is he calling you to do? Now, the one thing I can say that I love about God is that he he knows when he makes you, when he does your makeup, your emotional, your psychological makeup, he knows exactly what's going to, hmm, how can I say it? He knows exactly what's going to move you. He knows what's going to drive you. And the thing I want to say real quick on that is you will find I was talking to, uh, to someone about this the other day. You will find that many things that rattle your cage big time, 
many things that you get passionate about, that you get adamant about, that upset the crap out of you, that bring tears to your eyes, that, that, that stirs up that compassion in your heart, has to do with helping you identify your callings, your giftings, your talents, your propensities, the ones God wants to use. So, I want to let you know, it's time to start fasting and praying for the Lord to show you what your callings are, what your giftings are. There's more to you than what meets the eye. That's something you'll find out. There's more to you than what meets the eye. Because when God has something for you to do, baby, everything you need to do it is already in there. As you go, you will polish it. You will hone it. You will sharpen your skills. But you must stir up the gift that's within. You can't sit on your gift. You can't poop on your gift. You can't sleep on your gift. Stir it up. That's one thing you need to stir. All right. This is like stoking the fire in the fireplace. The more you stoke the wood, the, fire, the higher the flames go. The more you stoke your gifts, the more you stoke the fire of the Holy Ghost in you. Yeah. You get my drift? All right. Need I say more? Isaiah 44. Yet now, hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jerusalem, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. And I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass and as willows by the watercourses. One shall say, I am the Lord's. Another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Now, let me break that one down real quick. Some will be Lutheran, some will be Pentecostal, some will be uh, Pentecostal, Pentecostal, some will be Church of God, some will be Church of God in Christ, whatever. All right, let's move on. But they're all the body of Christ, are they not? Only the people that are true to God. We're not talking about churches and denominations. We're just describing how people affiliate themselves with different portions, different uh, expressions of the body of Christ. Let's say it like that. All right. Verse 6, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. And who, as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show unto them, fear ye not, neither be ye afraid. Have not I told you from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. And we're going to skip down because we see all the people that, that make graven images and how he gets on their case. Uh, all the stuff they get from the stock of a tree. They work with their hands and they form all these idols and then they bow to it. The same wood they use to stoke their fire with, the same wood they use to build their furniture with, the same wood they use to build houses with, and their hands are creating these gods. These gods are not self-contained. They won't be there unless a man's hands work on them. I'm just really breaking this down. And people are bowing and serving these gods, saying, 
deliver us, protect us, bless us to a stock of a tree. Let me move on before I get adamant about that. Mm, mm, mm. Verse 19, and one considereth in his heart, excuse me, and none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh, eat and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my hand? Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth in the singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, so much for abortion, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretches forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the token of liars and maketh diviners mad that turns wise men backwards and makes their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, check this out, there's real good news for all of us. Thou shalt be inhabited unto the cities of Judah, ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof that saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasures, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. In other words, baby, God's going to complete what he started. From the time you were in the womb, God already started orchestrating your destiny. He started orchestrating how you were going to serve him. He started orchestrating all the giftings and callings and the, and the things that were going to move you right in the direction that line up with his purpose for your life. You got a purpose. You weren't born here as an oops. You're not a poot in the wind. You're not a burp. You're not an oops. No, God designed you with his love. You are created with a purpose. I don't care how much abuse. I don't care about the mistreatment. I don't care about the emotional scars. I don't care about your shortcomings. I don't care about your weaknesses. I don't care about your insecurities. They don't hold water compared to God's ability to carry out his will in your life. When you look at Peter, in the New Testament, Peter was the wild card, wasn't he? But what did Jesus say to him? Upon this rock, I will build my church. See, it doesn't matter how screwy you are. It doesn't matter how jacked up you may feel and how uninterested people may 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 feel towards you about hearing whatever it is you have to share. It doesn't matter. Once you get healed from God and delivered on the inner man and strengthened on the inner man in the power of his might, and you get to the point where their opinions of you don't matter and what she said about you doesn't count and what he, the lie he told on you doesn't even add up to a hill of beans. When you get to the point where none of that matters to you, you're in a good place. God can use you a lot better because instead of you wasting your energy, licking your wounds, licking your wounds, they said this about me. They don't like me. 
I saw how he looked at me. She told me a lie. He doesn't want me. He doesn't want me to work for him. My mama doesn't want me to live with her. My uncle doesn't like me anymore. I got the blues. I got the blues. Instead of you wasting your time doing that, you got to shake that crap off. And, oh, thank you, Lord. Never thought of this. Picture a dog. Dog jumps in the swimming pool, jumps in the ocean, runs out from the water. What's the first thing that dog does? He shakes his whole body until all that fur has shaken off all that water. That's the way you got to shake off your little insecurities and your little setbacks and what they said and what how they looked at you and how they treated you and how they poo-pooed at you. No, you don't have time. You're called. You're a child of the Most High King. You're born with a purpose. You don't have time to dilly-dally in the childish things of this life. You don't have time to waste your emotions on petty stuff, on messy people, on childishness. You don't have time. Especially now with time winding up. You don't have the privilege of time. You have to get on the good foot. You got to get off that pot. You sat there, you cried long enough. Now get up off the pot. Don't forget to flush when you get up. Because all that crap you left behind you, it should be like rotor rooter. And away goes troubles down the drain. You don't have time for that crap. You have to seek God for your calling, for your purpose, for your giftings. And while you're seeking God for that, ask God to get you, help you to get to know yourself. You need to know not only your good side, you also need to know the bad stuff. You need to know what God has to put up with to use you. You need to see it in truth. Not in condemnation. Because God is not one that will condemn you. Jesus said, I have not come to condemn the world, but that the world through me will be saved. So he didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn you. Jesus is, is the edifier. That's why he's called to be a carpenter. He comes, he builds, he refurbishes, he repairs. That's what the Bible talks about. I will rebuild the old waste places. You will rebuild. You will replenish because I will replenish you. See, the bottom line you have to remember is that when God's hand is on you, he doesn't want you with your hand on the plow looking backwards. If, you, if you're pushing something forward and you got your head cocked all the way behind you, guess what? You're not going to get very far and you're going to be heading down a crooked path. You drive down the street. You're staring in your rearview mirror. You keep staring here. Please don't do that. Please don't take that. Don't, don't do that test. You keep staring in the rearview mirror and before you know it, you're going to be up in somebody's rear end, crashing their car into oblivion. And you may be sending yourself into eternity doing so. You cannot stare at the rear and go the way you're supposed to go. You cannot move forward when your whole life is based on what they did and what she said and what they did and what they didn't do and what they didn't give you that you needed. You don't have time for that. You just don't have time. So what you need to do while you're getting to know yourself, and God will show you if you ask him, that's the quickest way to get inner healing and deliverance. That way you're shedding a dead weight. So when God says, I want to move you to the high places in life, the dead weight's not going to keep your feet on the ground because you have chucked the dead weight. The higher you go, the better your perspective. You ever notice how much you can see from a plane? How much you can see from a hot air balloon? The higher you go, 
the more you can see stuff that you didn't even know was over there and over there. You didn't even know it because you were down at ground level. No, ground level is not going to show you that much. You got to rise above in order to really see. And when God wants to show you stuff, he'll show you things in your dreams. He'll show you things in visions. I remember I was engaged to a man to get married. And my sister had a vision going down Lake Avenue. And she said, Patty, your wedding gown is being made in turquoise. But I see you get married and your groom, you're wearing the same color. I don't know if it's pure white or off white, but you're not wearing turquoise. So I broke off the engagement. I wasn't even saved, but I had enough sense to pay attention to divine words like that. See, you have got to be seeking God right now. There are things in you God wants to do away with. There are other things in you God wants to hone, cultivate. He wants to strengthen. He wants to fortify. He wants to empower. He wants to ignite. But as long as you're sitting on that pot, staring behind you, and you refuse to flush, hmm, you're not going to get very far. As long as you are determined to drive that car staring in the rearview mirror, you might not get halfway down that block, let alone get to your destiny. Because something's good. There's going to be a lot of damage along the way as long as everything you do, every decision you make is based on how you feel about what happened back then. You will become your own worst enemy, not the devil. So remember, we're in the last days now. God has his hand on us. What are you going to do for the Lord? What are you going to do to prepare? Yeah, what are you going to do? I remember when the Lord called me. This is in natural form here. When the Lord called me, I heard a preacher say, you must position yourself for progress. You must position yourself for for growth. You must position your, yourself for advancement. You got to get in the car in order to go forward so you don't have to walk everywhere you're going. You got to get a job so you can buy a car, so you can put gas in the car, and you can drive forward. You save yourself a lot of time if you position yourself for the things God has for you. Are you studying, not just reading the Bible? Okay, let me see. 30 minutes. Let me read two chapters. Okay, I read two chapters. Bing! You're, you're, you're off to the races. Have you discussed those chapters with the Lord? Have you said, Lord, show me, open my eyes to see the hidden treasures in your word, the hidden revelations that you only show to your people? How many times did you read that chapter or that verse? How many books have you bought? You got a Bible? Whoopee! Get yourself a Bible dictionary, Strong's Concordance, exhaustive Strong's Concordance, Thompson Chain. The Thompson Chain reference Bible is in total sync with the Strong's Concordance. And you can look up the words in your verses, find the word, look at the number under the word, go to the strong concordance, turn to that number, and bam, there that word is in the Greek or the Hebrew. All the different angles of that word. That's how you milk the word. That's how you start getting even more revelation. What are you doing to equip yourself for the calling of God? Hmm? You watch people speak publicly and you wonder what makes this one look better than that one? What makes this one keep your attention more than that one? Okay, you got a calling, but you got to hone your skill. Take a drama class. Learn how to relate to the, to the audience. Learn how to interact with people. It's not just all super spiritual. The more you hone your craft, 
the better you'll be at reaching all kinds of people. Then you want to be all things to all people. So there are times you may have to watch some movies or some programs where you're dealing with inmates. And you watch how they relate to each other, how they talk. What if God calls you to prison ministry? You're going to go to a bunch of inmates talking to them like you're preaching a lecture to a bunch of college professors? I don't think so. See, you got to, you have to ask God to show you how to interact with different people. It's not just your people. It's not just your neighborhood. It's not just your race. And it's not just people of your age. You have to be able to, if a man says, I need to talk to you, and he wants to sit at the bar because that's the only place he feels comfortable, and you go and sit at the bar with him, you're bringing a Holy Ghost in there. And that man starts talking, you ought to be, hey, man, what's up? Yeah, hey, I heard, yeah, I heard that. Da, 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 da. You ought to be able to talk in a relaxed manner. Don't come in there with your college education. They don't want to hear that. Don't come in talking about, do you know Jesus? You know you're going to hell if you don't get saved. No, find out what they need. Listen to them. Spend time with them. Develop interpersonal reaction, interpersonal relationship. Get to know what makes them tick and ask God to reveal to you how to make the approach. You land differently on different landing strips. You got to know how to land this one. God uses fishermen as an example. You got to use bait. Different fish use different bait. You're not going to catch a shark with the bait you use for a yuppie. You're not going to catch a catfish with the bait that you use for whiting. That's about as far as my knowledge goes, so don't expect me to go down the list. I don't know what I'm talking about after that. The bottom line is God knows what bait to use. You can be talking, listening to somebody, and you realize, oh, wow, they got family issues. So here's your landing approach. Here's your approach now. Here's how you taxi the runway. I was just thinking about my family. Boy, that, those, that, they are some nuts. You know that? Now you're coming down to where he's at. He's, uh, now he can relate. Oh, really? Family? Family issues? Really? Now you got him in there. You got the hook. Right. Now you let him talk for a while. You listen. You got to ask God to teach you how to approach people. Jesus met people at their need. When he talked to farmers, he talked to farmers about planting seeds. When he talked to different types of people, he talked to them from different levels, from different approaches. You have to ask God to teach you how to hone your gift. I, I mean, you can give me, how could I say it? You can give me this computer, but the computer's sitting on my table. If I never bother to find out how to use the doggone thing, how to turn it on, how to open up email, how to create an email, how to receive an email and send an email, the computer's not going to do me any good. It's a nice gift, but I can't use it. Whatever gift you have from God, you have to ask the giver to teach you how to use the gift. He'll even teach you what not to do with that gift. That's called wisdom. We're in the last days now. We know that. Even unsaved people know that. But we have to seek God for strategy, strategic maneuvers. Think about it. You ever watch movies with special ops and, and people that have these skills of surviving on the land? They've been trained and people marvel at their ability. I mean, a, 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 a street cop, a cop on the beat, he can't come close to that. He doesn't even know what's going on. He doesn't have a clue. 
God can create you to be one of his special ops. You want to be a street cop? I mean, if that's what God calls you to do, do it with all your heart because we need street cops too. How high do you want to go? Because the higher you raise the bar, the higher you will land. When life gets through whipping you around, and it will whip you. Everybody gets their whooping from life. But where will you land when the wind ceases? Where will you end up? How will you go through? All of that is part of your making and your calling. What's your attitude? Mm-hmm. Your attitude will make you or break you, baby. What's your perspective on life? You can cripple yourself by your outlook or you can be determined no matter what the circumstances say to me. I know God is for me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? What is your perspective? What is, what is your level of determination? Lynette asked me last night when she was babysitting me. She said, so are we going to have church tomorrow? The reason she asked me that, this is an inserted explanation, is because I fell on the bottom step thinking I was at the bottom landing. And when I stepped, stepped forward, there was nothing under my feet. And I fell and my head bounced on the tile floor. So as you can see from these pictures, I had lumps on my head and I've kept an ice pack to stop myself from swelling up even further, hoping that the swelling would come down. And as you can see, through much prayer, Lynn and Lynette babysitting me and Peter's prayers, I am doing much better. So I just want you to see, this is what Lynette was asking me. She thought I might not want to have church because I might not have felt well. So this is what I was talking about. I said, well, I said, nah, you know, I mean, I didn't say all I wanted to say, but I'm going to say it now. Back in 2016, I didn't have God's church of love online. So yes, I took off for the whole two weeks that I was in ICU. But I'm going to tell you right now, if I'm in the hospital, if I'm laying on my bed and I got a cell phone I can dial in, we're going to have church. I don't care if all we do is pray. We're going to have church because we're going to get together. I'm not going to let no monkey in hell stop no show. I don't have time to lick my wounds. And, oh, this hurts and that hurts and oh, my belly and oh, oh I don't have time for that. I got work to do for the Lord. When I saw this man, and that's what inspired me to cop that attitude. I saw a man. He was in his 30s, late 20s, early 30s, around 29 to 32, right in there. This man was bedridden. He was a quadriplegic. That means he had no use of his limbs. Nothing but his head and his neck. That's all he had going for him. And that man had all this set up. The church had set up and bought him all this, this computer equipment and everything was voice activated and he was taught how to use it. And his ministry was laying on his bed, whether it was on his back or on his side, laying on his bed 24-7. Mm -hmm, being fed through a tube in his belly, laying on his bed, ministering and counseling other people who didn't have half the problems he did. But he was lifting spirits. He was fortifying other people. He didn't lay there saying, God has forsaken me. I don't, I don't know why he is allowing this. I don't know. He was so busy loving on other people, he didn't take the time to join a pity party. What would you do if God put you in the bed permanently? But the bottom line is don't let, I got to say it in bad English. That's the only way it's going to sound right is if I say it wrong. 
Don't let no monkey stop your show. Don't let no monkey hinder you from moving forward for the Lord. Don't let no monkey get between you and your future, you and your destiny, you and your calling. Don't do that. Don't you dare. Not with all that Jesus did on the cross. Okay. Mother has spoken. And don't y'all call me mother either. You can call me grandma. That works. Or Mama Sita, that works too. Anyway, love you guys. God bless you. Be encouraged. And whatever you do, seek God with all your might. When you seek him with all your heart, soul, strength, and might, you will find him when you seek him with all your heart. That's word. You will find him. But seek him. You may not find him today. You might not find him next week or next month. Mm -hmm. But he's faithful. And he won't leave you hanging after such a diligent search. Amen. God bless you.